Welcome to the January 10th, 2022 meeting of the Westerville Board of Education. We'll get started here. Um, and as we begin this evening, this is our organizational meeting, so I'd like to pass it to Ms. Marshall to swear in our uh, newly elected and returning members. Thank you, Mrs. Davidson, Ms. Meyer, uh, Dr. Esther Baker, please work, join me out for it. So I'm going to ask you a question. Can you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear and affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the State of Ohio, and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge your duties as board member in and for the said Westerville City School District in Franklin and Delaware counties of Ohio, and to the best of your ability and in accordance with the laws now in effect, and here and after to be enacted during any continuance in said office and until a successor is chosen and qualified. I do. I do. I do. All right. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, Mrs. Meyer, Mrs. Davidson, and Dr. Nestor Baker. It's a pleasure to serve with you. So moving on to agenda item two, um, calling this meeting to order. I'd like to thank you for attending tonight's meeting of the Westerville City Schools Board of Education. In accordance with the Westerville City Schools COVID-19 guidelines, in-person attendance requires the wearing of a mask or facial covering while indoors. This evening's agenda will be displayed on the screens in the front of the room. You may also follow along by connecting to the district's website at www.wcsoh.org. Click on our district link, then select Board of Education, and then Board Docs Agenda, and select this evening's meeting. There will be two opportunities to address the board this evening, the first being Agenda Item 8.01. The first set of comments is relative to Agenda Items 9.01 through 13.05. Please state the agenda items you're referencing at the beginning of your comments. And the second opportunity for public comment is agenda item 14.01. There's a sign-up sheet located on the table in the back of the room. Each speaker will have five minutes to address the board and a timer will be shown on the screen. With that, Ms. Marshall, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Altman? Here. Mrs. Davidson? Here. Mrs. Meyer? Here. Dr. Nestor Baker? Here. Mr. Bell? Here. Thank you, and please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And moving on to the next agenda item, which is 4.01, um, nominations for the Office of President. So at this time, um, we're going to ask for a motion and a second for nominations for the Office of President. So do I have a motion or a second? To open the to open the nominations for the office of president, yes. So moved. Second. Thank you. And Ms. Marshall, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Bell? Yes. Ms. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Thank you. And at this time, um, are there nominations to be made for the office of president? Yes, I would like to move to nominate Tracy Davidson for the president of the Westerville City School Board of Education. Thank you. Are there other nominations to be made? 
I move we close nominations. Thank you. Second. Thank you for that. Ms. Marshall, would you call the roll, please? Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Myers? Yes. Myers. Thank you. And we had the motion in the second. And so um, at this point, we would like to call the roll on that nomination. Yes. So this is for the election of Tracy Davidson, Davidson as the president. Yep. Thank you. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Congratulations, Mrs. Davidson, President Davidson. Yeah, I guess we get to switch seats here. Yeah. <laughs> you made it look really easy and smooth, Jen. Well done. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Um, up next, I would like to open nominations for the Office of Vice President. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. This is Meyer. Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Um, may I have uh, any nominations in a second? Yes. I would like to nominate uh, Mrs. Jennifer Altman uh, for the Office of Vice President. I move we close nominations. Thank you. Second. And we'll vote to close. Yep. Dr. Nesterbreaker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Ottman? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Thank you. And then you vote. Yep. You want to call the so, vote for Jen for Vice President? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and congratulations, Jen. Yeah, thank you. Um, 5.1 School Board Recognition. I'm going to pass that on to Dr. Kellogg and Ms. Marshall. Thank you, President Davidson, and uh, welcome back to the presidency. Ms. Altman, congratulations on your election as vice president. Excited to work with you. January is our annual school board appreciation month, and it's a great, great pleasure on behalf of the district for Ms. Marshall and I to say thank you to our school board members this evening. I have a few prepared comments I wanted to present. We also have a certificate of appreciation for you and a proclamation uh, provided by Governor DeWine that was sent to school board members for you this evening to take home and add to your long list of uh, accolades and awards uh, for yourself. So um, first of all, welcome to Ms. Meyer, our new board member. Welcome back, Ms. Davidson and Dr. Nestor Baker on your reelection. It's a pleasure to have you back here with us. Uh, and as always, Vaughn and Jen, it's, it's always nice to have you here as well. Um, we also want to acknowledge Rick Verlado, who isn't with us this evening, but I got to spend eight years next to him as a board member, and we thank him for his contributions, as well as the many other community members, some of whom are still sitting in the audience who have served the school district and some of our former school board members. So thank you to all of them for their work. And I look forward, I know uh, Ms. Marshall and our team looks forward to working with you in our continued leadership and partnership. You know, since this time last year, a lot of our work's been dominated by this pandemic. Um, and, and we've had to consider how to keep the process of education going while protecting health and safety about, of about 17,000 people each day and their families, staff, students, and families. And uh, your leadership has contributed to that. Um, and despite that once-in-a-lifetime once challenge um, for the board, you kept your eye on the future and what we're trying to build as a school district and being a value to our community. And so there's some things I think are worth 
remembering in our rearview mirror that we've started and are working on and nearing completion or, or just getting on the front end of. And so, for example, a great one would be our facilities master plan. Um, we are uh, 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 getting towards the actual tail end of that five-year plan as we get ready to open Minerva Park, excuse me, Minerva France uh, Elementary School. Um, we're going to do, do a tour for our staff next week that are interested in applying there. Minerva Park Element, uh, Middle School is grounds broken and there's things that look like walls going up. That's exciting. Um, a lot of our renovations at Anhurst and some of our other buildings are done. Our secured entryway projects are nearing the completion. All of that work is coming together. Hawthorne and Whittier designs are coming together. All that work is coming together and, and your leadership throughout this time period from conception to where we are has been really important to that. So we thank you for that. Our work on Ports River Graduate and your leadership there and helping us define what teaching and learning and what the outcomes for our students should be and bringing community voice in that. A thousand community members who participate in designing our Ports River Graduate. We're on the front end of that work, but we see it as important work moving forward. Our work in the district on equity and your emphasis on that as a, as a board and looking through that lens and providing the resources and the staffing we need to keep that work moving along. Um, throughout this pandemic, it's been evident to us that's an important piece of our work. The pandemic has really made that clear. Um, and your leadership there and your commitment to that has been important. Providing resources during this pandemic, there's been a number of times where we've had to do last minute shifts, make last minute requests, um, getting federal dollars that help influence the work we do and providing resources to people. You have all been just on top of that and, and very um, focused on the health and well being of our students and our families. You've been advocates on the Fair School Funding Plan with our legislators and instrumental in helping move that along and advocating about other funding issues and legislative agendas of our, of our elected officials that we think are important to us in Westerville City Schools. You've been strong advocates there going downtown, uh, talking to our elected officials and keeping that in front of them. You've ensured that our financial footings, we in November listened to Ms. Marshall present our five-year forecast. It, it, it's something that guides our work and your leadership there and your commitment to making that a guidepost for us has been really instrumental in helping us use the resources we have effectively and I know that's always in the back of your mind. I find you all to be extremely um, committed to listening to our stakeholders, whether the voice is one or the voices of, of hundreds. You listen carefully, you read carefully, you bring those perspectives forward and you weigh them um, and consider those in your decision making and we really value that um, and I know the community does. And most importantly, what I'm most excited about, and it's kind of a preview for our community coming up, the work we're going to do to uh, continue moving forward on uh, putting in place things that drive our strategic plan. The workshop, work sessions we got coming up on our schedule that the, the community get to see, I think is laying the groundwork for the next several years to keep us moving forward, uh, even as we uh, figure out how to uh, get to the end of this pandemic. I think that's going to be very important. And your leadership and asking for that to say, hey, Let's put some things together this spring so we can get our eye on the prize for the long term and what we're going to bring to our kids. And so that's of great value. To be able to keep your heads out of the weeds and look forward to where we want to be as a, as a district is really important. So there's a lot you've accomplished and you provide leadership to. Um, you're advancing the district. We're improving experiences for our students and staff. And so we thank you for that and offer you the, the small token of appreciation in the form of a certificate and the, and the governor's uh, resolution. And I would uh, also like to give Ms. Marshall an opportunity um, uh, to, to share her thoughts as well as we recognize you. Yeah, and I can you. hand out the certificates. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kellogg. So, yes, I am so thankful for the Board of Education that we have, that we've had, and that we continue to have. You all are wonderful people. You are absolutely passionate about the work that we do in education. And not only as your treasurer and CFO, but as just a parent of the school district, I couldn't be more thankful for the work that you do every day. Unless you've been in this position as a school board member, I don't think you know how hard it is that you take on the shoulders, on your shoulders, the burden of everything and how it affects the community. And I just think you all are wonderful people and you've handled it with grace and dignity. And I just very much appreciate you, so thank you. Thank you both for the kind words. We, we truly appreciate it. Um, up next, 5.2 School Board Appreciation Resolution by Mayor Diane Conley. Welcome. I think it's apropos that the first time I come back to a school board meeting in 11 years is as the <laughs> mayor to uh, read a resolution for our school board. Even in 
what we used to call normal times, being a school board member was a hard job. I am just amazed at how well all of you have run the district in these last, seems like 40 years, but two years. Um, the community really, really thanks you. And so on behalf of city council, I have a proclamation. And this is my first proclamation as mayor. So once again, it's apropos. Mm -hmm. Whereas it is one of the responsibilities of the mayor of the city of Westerville to recognize occasions of outstanding significance, whereas our community values a quality education is a vital step along the pathway to success for our children, and whereas local school board members contribute greatly to this community through their service, and whereas these local decision makers set policies and procedures to govern all aspects of the school district operations, and whereas the school board keeps attention focused on the progress toward the school district schools and maintains a two-way communication loop with all segments of the community, and whereas these school board members are serving our community with integrity, honor, and a commitment to our children's futures. Now, therefore, I, Diane Conley, Mayor of the City of Westerville, Ohio, do, her do hereby declare my appreciation to the members of the Westerville City School District Board of Education and proclaim January 2022 as School Board Recognition Month in Westerville and urge all citizens to join me in recognizing the dedication and hard work of our local school board members and in working with them to mold an education system that meets the needs of both today's and tomorrow's children. And it's signed by Diane Conley, Mayor of the City of Westerville. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, 6.1, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the Board of Education meeting held Monday, December 13th, 2021, as presented. So moved. Second. Any comments? Go ahead. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Um, I abstain since I wasn't up here. Yep. <laughs> Dr. Nesterbaker? I also abstain because I wasn't there. Okay. Okay. Ms. Davidson? Yes. Thank you. Um, 7.1, we have a superintendent's report. So Dr. Kellogg's going to talk to us for a little bit. Thank you, President Davidson and members of the board. I do want to give a, just a brief update. Um, on where we are in the district right now, particularly as it relates to COVID. So we've been back five full days, um, and we're learning a lot real quick. Um, uh, the timing of our return of our students and staff was right at the front end of this surge as it started to affect communities. And so um, we have spent, um, our team has spent a considerable amount of time getting a handle on the numbers. Um, we have uh, uh, several nurses who work at the district office whose responsibility is taking in the information on positive cases and quarantines and and providing information to people and frankly um, they've been overloaded in fact um, two of them at least two of them spent the weekend working on the weekend trying to catch up on the emails and phone calls just to process the information and get out to people what they need to know about returning to school and returning to work so it's it's been um, not a wave but a tsunami that's come at us pretty quick um, as we all know and I, I don't want to go through specific numbers but case rates are up, positivity rates are up. We've all seen the news about hospitals and what they're dealing with. We all know that's the case. We know that this particular variant is, um, doesn't make people as sick, but it does make them sick and it wipes them out for, for several days. And so whereas we're not seeing school transmission as an issue, um, we are seeing uh, people out from community spread and missing, missing school. And most importantly, um, not to dismiss the number of kids who are missing school, but where it's really impacting us in our ability to stay open is um, in terms of staffing. And so just some, um, some areas that we're dealing with, of course, in transportation. I know our community um, is frustrated and probably as tired as we are between our hour delays and early releases. You may recall that um, before winter break, we add an, an early release um, piece to our, our arsenal. That's a 20 minute for middle school, 30 minute for high school to decrease the amount of time. And we use that um, as best as possible. And unfortunately, there have been on days where we've had to rotate putting a secondary school 
or schools on remote. Those have tended uh, to be because of transportation related issues, not, be, not because of teacher staffing issues or uh, transmission and school issues. It tends to be transportation. Um, the other place we're feeling it, and this is now becoming more of a concern, is in food service. We were down about 30% of our staff between open positions and people out for illness um, and have had to staff that. And in fact, Jill and Jennifer, who are back there, who joined us this evening, have spent time on lunch lines uh, serving food, as have principals and, and other staff people. So um, we're really feeling it there. And one of the things our community has seen, our, our families and students have seen, we've had to limit our menu options because we, we don't have enough people to prep enough food. We're also being hit with some of the supply chain issues related to food, too. Um, we had one recently, uh, one of our local pizza vendors that we rely on for pizza recently told us they were not able to fulfill our request because they didn't have enough staff. So the ripple effects are there. So that's one that we keep an eye on as well. Custodial issues. We know how we have a um, small but mighty force of custodians keeping our buildings clean and healthy. We're starting to see some problems there that are affecting us as well. So, and then importantly, where we feel it the most is in class coverage. So I, I can give you some examples. Today, I think was the highest, I think I'll have the numbers right. I'm, I'm close within plus or minus a, a small margin of error. I think the number was 185 teachers out today, 91 uncovered classes. So we had a fill rate substitutes covering those classes of 38.5%, I think it was. That is not uncommon. What the, what, what's happening is each day we have a few more teachers out than the day before, so we keep breaking the record. We don't have enough substitutes to cover, and so we are pulling from all kinds of places to cover classes. In fact, uh, people like Ann Baldwin have covered classes. Um, up and down the system, we have people. We have an army of people that we deploy and send to buildings that are really in shorthanded to help, help provide coverage, and that's things like lunch duty, so you can imagine if you're uh, a, a middle school principal and your assistant principal's out, you're not covering all the lunches. Um, and so there's all these little things that come with it um, as part of it. We are keeping our, you know, we've been hopeful in the fall about being able to change our K-12 mask mandate. I don't see any change at that at this time. I think we need to stay with it. It's consistent with, with uh, all the recommendations and all the call outs. We're trying to keep our schools open, relying on our mitigation strategies. I will tell you, as you know, we opened the year with a 10-day quarantine. We stayed with the previous quarantine standards that were in place. CDC, on the day we came back, announced the change. Um, we wanted to get a handle on where we are, were from our numbers. I will tell you that um, at this point, we've set a date and communication, I think, is going out tonight or tomorrow to staff where we're going to go ahead and align with CDC for staff and do the five-day return. And soon behind that, we will do the same thing for students. So we're going to make that change here over the next couple of days um, to reduce the quarantine time period and, and keep an eye on things. It does present some concern um, because you, it, it does shorten that quarantine period. We are um, uh, having a K-12 mask mandate as a strength to that because they call for that. But I would, I would share with our community, our problem is not transmission in schools. Our problem is transmission when they leave school and uh, the degree to which people are masking up were in congregate settings and, and how they're doing things outside of school. Um, some things um, to expect, even with the change in the quarantine, I would still tell our community, expect some late starts, expect some early dismissals, expect some remote days still in the future. Um, expect limited food options, um, keep that in mind. Um, and expect that you're going to see classrooms where teachers are absent for extended period of times for illness. Even if it's five days, it's five days, and we know that, that that's a lot. Um, so expect those things, and, and we will continue to do our best to keep our schools open and for in-person learning. But we are going to change that quarantine standard line with the CDC over the next couple of days, so our, our staff and our community can expect that. So if you're interested in how you can help, because I know everybody wants to know that, um, we, we are processing drivers um, as substitute drivers, so that takes some time. It, you, you just don't turn the keys over to someone and say, drive a bus with 75 kids in it. So if people are interested in that work, we're still looking for substitutes. We're still looking for food service employees and substitutes. That's always a place where we could use help. Teacher substitutes. Here's what I know about teacher substitutes. When you look at the data, the uh, 
ESC, Educational Service Centers, who we contract with, and there's 20-something other school districts that contract with them for substitutes. Their pool of substitutes is down 500 from where it was in its peak at 2019. So you have the same number of school districts going after subs that are down about 500. And uh, I'm not sure the total number. I want to say that the total number in the past was somewhere around 3,800. So they're down a significant number of substitutes. So you got a large number of people competing for the same pool of substitutes. Efforts to attract more subs by raising our pay rate, we've done that, don't do the trick. Here's what I know about our substitutes. If you plot where our substitutes come from, the vast majority of them come within a 20 minute radius of Westerville City Schools. It's an easy drive, it's a known community. So if we have people in our community who are interested in helping out and interested in subbing, let us know. Um, we could actually hold a substitute training uh, piece here in the district. The ESC would come here and do that. So we're considering on hosting something like that. Uh, the ESC has streamlined their process and made it easier. So if people are interested in that, um, we know that, um, frankly, if we had about 30 more people on a daily basis picking jobs up in Westerville, the pressure on our system would go down a lot in terms of amount of teacher coverage we got going on. So keep that in mind. Um, packing lunch is always <laughs> helpful too. Um, we do keep in mind, we're still under free lunch for everybody. And, that, and that's an ease, but the demand is up from what we're used to, and that's putting pressure on us. Um, consider the vaccine, consider the booster. Um, practice those recommended health practices even when you're not in school. Um, you know, it's always a little frustrating to go to, for example, a basketball game. We ask people to mask up and we see a very, uh, variations in how compliant to that people are. That's disappointing. I would tell our coaches, and we talked about it, if you want to keep that team on the court all year long, the best thing to do is keep those kids safe and healthy. And the best way to do that is social distance masking and doing the best you can. So I want to continue those things. So um, we, those are the things we're doing in place. Um, uh, uh, the employee shortages, et cetera. Um, and I, th that's, that's where I'd say we're at this point. So happy to answer any questions that the board might have or clarify anything to the best, the best of my ability, but that's where we're at right now. Um, Dr. Kellogg, I have a question. I'm wondering if you could run through a scenario what, for, for parents to understand. Um, so if I have a child, or I myself as a parent um, was to contract COVID and was unable to distance from my child, how long would that child have to quarantine? So in-home exposure is different than in-community exposure because it means the, the individual is constantly exposed to, so if you read what the CDC says, they spell out very, very succinctly about a 10-day quarantine under those conditions that uh, testing would be, that you look at testing, you look at masking at home and isolation. So there's a lot in that question in terms of what is the behavior at home to keep that person, to reduce the probability that person is now going to um, become um, uh, COVID positive. So putting those things in place. Our nurses have um, specific protocols they'll share with families when they share where they're at with things. But under those conditions, um, that's going to be a longer, a, a longer period of quarantine because of the positive case when they are cleared and then when that individual who's been in that close contact now adds on. So that's a longer period of quarantine, although the five-day rule will reduce some of that. But those are probably the longest periods under which people are going to be quarantined. Um, and as I said, um, I, our nurses will provide information to families of exactly what their quarantine period is and, and answer a specific family questions. So, John, I'm, I'm just going to reiterate something that you said while I was making notes on what you were saying. I want to make sure that I heard it correctly. You said that if we had an additional 30 people in, in our system to help alleviate some of the, the shortages, the sub shortages, that it would significantly relieve the pressure on the district, right? I heard that correctly. 30 people. So, you know, when you hear about the problems, you know, whether it's the, the transportation runs or whether it's class coverage or food service issues or custodial or whatever the, the issue may be, when um, people in our community and other communities hear those things, it feels as though the problem is insurmountable, and it's not. 
Uh, on the one hand, we are, we, I should say, everyone out there is doing all that they can do to help alleviate these, these issues within the buildings and within the, the district itself. But we could really use help from the community. 30 people, that's not that many. And the problem is not as large as sometimes it feels like it can be. 30 people. So if you know, anyone feels that they might be interested in subbing, please reach out to the district. Please give a call, send an email, and uh, have some conversation about what that might look like and where you might fit. Because as we look at the significant issues and the expectations that you were outlining that we all need to hold right now, some of those pressures can be reduced with 30 people. So thank you for that information. That really helps contextualize it, I think. The expectations are big and the problems are hard and the solutions may be within our own community. The, the, the ripple effects of teachers constantly having to give up free periods, planning time, lunch periods to cover other people's classes or take additional kids on, day after day after day has an erosional impact on them as humans and on the, yeah. the, the instruction. Um, so yeah, I said 30, 50 is even better. Yes. Right? So let's aim know, for 60. Yeah. It, yeah and, and you know, it's like the old starfish analogy. I may not save them all, but I'll save this one. So every little thing, and we have other things in place we've, we've put out. We've, we've talked with WA leadership about strategies. We've eliminated any district level meeting that requires teachers or principals to be out of their buildings and just taking that away. Um, we are working uh, with our principals to reduce the number of faculty meetings they might have to give teachers more planning time. So we're looking at other strategies to reduce other kinds of responsibilities. But everything we take away wasn't there before because we didn't need it. It was there because it was important in moving us forward in some of those other initiatives. So everything we take away is reducing our ability to make progress. And, and that's OK because we're in a moment. Um, but I, I, it just starts to become problematic. Um, so yes, more hands on deck helping out, the better off we would be. Um, as a little bit of a follow-up, a couple of things that have been alluded to. So um, it's 30, right, or 50 or 60 there. Um, in food service, you mentioned we have both positions that were unfilled, regular positions that were unfilled, and substitute positions. So that's something I want to highlight. These are not all substitute positions, right? Some of these are long-term positions. Some of those are long-term positions, salaried positions, yeah. Yeah. Hourly so positions. I think that's important for everyone to know. And then. You mentioned briefly about teachers splitting classes, but can you talk us through so that we all and community understands when we are short subs, what happens? So at the elementary level, if we don't have coverage for a classroom, principals are pretty creative. Sometimes they'll pull other staff um, that may not have um, direct teaching responsibilities. For example, instructional coaches, um, they'll rely on school guidance counselors. Um, and one of the uh, strategies is you'll split the class between the other grade level teachers. So now you've got a problem where we've got more kids in the room too. Uh, and that just makes it challenging. So, um, and I know of many a case where the principal in the building ends up covering for the day. I know I was having a conversation with Ernest Klingscale down in Hawthorne and he talked about having two kindergarten classes he took one day he had on either side of the gym. <laughs> and bless his heart, that's what he did for the day um, on top of lunch coverage and recess. At the secondary level, what you traditionally do, because teachers teach in those five period cycles, is you'll pull teachers from their duty responsibilities um, and may ask them to give up their planning period and oftentimes their lunch period to see if they will uh, provide support for that if we can't fill it in. We do have a number of district staff people um, who we have as a team and we have a system in place where we send them to uh, any building that's having trouble. Walnut Springs last week was really struggling with 12 or 13 uncovered classes, per, uncovered teachers, not classes, uncovered teachers times five classes, right? And so we were sending people down there so um, we might be doing lunch duty so the principal can cover a class or we might be doing, covering a class. And I, a lot of that's going on um, to, to try and alleviate the problem. So that's how we solve it. Um, and it also means 
you may be pulling teacherized responsibility for small group intervention, and you forego that small group intervention that day in order to cover the greater good of 30 kids. So it's these trade-offs that people are having to make at the ground level. And from a building administrative perspective, that dominates your whole day because you're thinking about that hour to hour about what am I going to do this next hour? What and so some of the other things, classroom observations for teacher feedback don't get done, returning phone calls, checking on your email, all that stuff goes to another part of the day. And, you know, it's, it's, it's tough work. And I, I know um, it is similar in a lot of industries. A lot of people are experiencing this in other industries as well with, with shortage. Um, so I'm, I'm not naive in thinking this is just a school issue. It's in a lot of different places. We're all experiencing in other places we go. Um, so uh, that, that's where we're at, and, and I appreciate the echoing of, of call out for if there's people in the community who are thinking, how can I help? Yeah, uh, those would be some places to come help, and um, email me or anybody in the team, and we'll, we'll get you connected. Thank you for that. It helps to paint the picture of what's actually going on every day and how hard everyone is working to cover and keep kids in school, which we say thanks a lot up here, but I think there's never been a time when we have owed so much to so many um, staff and administrators for just every day going through that to make it happen. So thank you. Uh, John, I just have a quick uh, question about status of vaccination and booster. So thinking about what the guidelines are for the CDC, I know we can't take that into account for our students. Do we do that for our staff or where are we at with that? That's a great question, Ms. Davidson. I'd have to defer to Tammy Sant and her team okay. to find out what we're doing there with that change, because that is a change. I know you're right with our students. Ohio law prevents us from right. asking their vaccine status. Right. Um, uh, I'm not sure, and I'd have to get an answer, but I'll find out for the board and, and provide that to you all in an email. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 8.1, public comments, and we just have one person tonight. Um, just a quick reminder, you have five minutes. We're gonna ask you to wear your mask um, and keep your comments professional, avoid use of inappropriate language, refrain from identifying individuals in the event of a complaint, and please address your comments to the board and not the audience. And our first speaker is Peg Duffy. My comments relate to item 13.01, to appoint the board designee as public records official. This is Ms. Marshall. This is on the agenda every year via uh, city council, school board, township trustees. Very mundane thing, we take it for granted. The training is available to all of us, to everybody out there, to the board members, to me, not just to elected officials. And that's a point I'd like to make. Ms. Marshall, or whoever is in the position for a similar uh, in other governmental bodies, certainly shoulders the burden. But we make it easier, all of us in the community, as well as the board members, if we have a better understanding. And I would suggest if you have not taken, if you've never taken or have not taken in the last two or three years this particular course, it would be a good idea because with all of the changes, we have conveniences with electronic communications, but we have more complications. Personally, in the last six years, I experienced two times when our board, a board member told me, no, you can't have that record. In one of those, fortunately, not supposed to use names, but I'll credit Ms. Marshall, she was present in the discussion and she said, yes, you're allowed to have that. So we all need to have a better understanding. I would encourage people to take the course. You take it online. It takes three hours. It's interesting. In the changes that have occurred since I took it last time, I've got to retake it. I'll admit that. <laughs> Thank you, Peg. Um, financials, 9.1, a resolution to participate in state and federal funded programs for fiscal year 2022. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, President Davidson, members of the board. Um, so this is our, so part of the organizational meeting, we have a whole slew of resolutions for you tonight. This is one of the many that I have on the agenda. So this is just a reminder that we do participate in state and federal programs. We receive a lot of grant money through um, the state of Ohio and also through the federal government. So this will allow us to continue to receive that money that we're entitled to. Some of it's um, competitive grants and some of it's just entitlement grants based on our demographics and other entitlements, so. Any questions? No. Go ahead and call the roll, please. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Ottman? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. 9.2, a resolution to approve request from the treasurer. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Ms. Marshall, whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you again. So there is a whole list of things in here. I wanna go through those so that you understand what they are. Um, so number one is just purchase necessary services and materials. This will just allow us to continue operations. Uh, transfer, number two is transfer outstanding stale data checks to the general fund, so once we have checks that are older than six months, we can transfer those back and we'll reissue them if, like as we follow up with people if we need to. Um, execute all contracts within the normal course of business within the annual appropriated amounts. So the board passes the annual appropriations resolution, which we amend throughout the year from time to time. And so this allows me to execute, sign any contracts that we have for, during the normal course of business. Advance funds from the general fund to other funds as needed to meet the obligations and report these advances to the Board of Education. We haven't had to do this in a long time. Um, this would be if we had a fund go into a negative cash balance situation. Usually that, that happens with grants, but because we're able to get a project cash request put in in time at the end of the month and be reimbursed, we haven't really had to deal with that. But we have it on here just in case. Uh, to invest interim and inactive funds in accordance with Ohio Revised Code, and that's something that we do. Uh, to sign all payroll checks, that's always important. Uh, all general account checks, purchase orders, and contracts with original mechanical or facsimile signature of the treasurer. Request amended certificates and estimated resources from the Franklin and Delaware County auditors as needed, so we do that um, during the normal course of business so that we are able to encumber those funds in purchase orders and write checks against them. Uh, request and execute on behalf of the Board of Education the advance of all tax and funds as they may be available for distribution from Franklin County Treasurer and Delaware County Treasurer. So this just lets us, as ta property taxes are collected, to receive advances from the county instead of waiting until the property tax settlement date. And we can uh, revest we can request an advance of up to 90% of what's collected so far. And then we have um, the tax abatement. We'll, we will file this resolution with the tax commissioner of Ohio to let them know that we would like to be um, notified of any application for exemption of taxation. And then we are waving, waving the reading of the minutes since the board receives those in advance of the meeting we don't have a formal reading of minutes at the board meeting. So that's all of these resolutions. Any questions? You can call the roll, please. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Ottman? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. 9.3, a resolution to approve the Board of Education participation are we participating in? I'm so sorry. Ohio School Boards Association Legal Assistance Fund, the Westerville Chamber of Commerce, and Ohio School Boards Association. May I have a motion? So, so moved. Second. Ms. Marshall? Um, so this is just what it says. So this will allow our um, participation to work with the Ohio School Boards Association and then also contribute to their legal um, defense fund, which we, legal assistance fund, which we do every year and then the Westerville Chamber of Commerce, which is our local chamber here that we support. Any, Any questions? questions? Whenever you're ready. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. 
9.4, a resolution to appoint a delegate and an alternate delegate to the 2022 annual Ohio School Boards Association business meeting. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. We have to name them. Yes. <laughs> Can we name them in the motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> Any takers? Christy, would you like to do it? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, who gets appointed to these? <laughs> usually, usually the newbie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It is actually a really good yeah. experience. Yeah. That's it fine. truly I, is. Yes, I'm happy to do it. So you'll be the delegate. Who would like to be the alternate? I'd actually be happy to be the alternate. Oh, wonderful. Look at that. <laughs> Two takers. I'm going to amend my motion yes. <laughs> to uh, name Christy Meyer as the delegate and Jen Altman as the alternate delegate for the um, annual conference. Thank you. Second. Is there a second to that? I seconded. Thank you. Right. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Thank you both. Uh, 9.5, a resolution to approve the purchases in accordance with ORC 5705.41 and board policy 6320. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you, President Davidson, members of the board. So this is what we call then and now purchase order. So this is a situation where we had a purchase order that was in, that was put into place after the date of an invoice. Um, this is for ProCare. We contract with ProCare for coverage for some of our related services. Um, and so this was a matter of just timing of when people went out and the emergency of having people fill in for them. So. Any questions? Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mrs. Davidson. Yes. Up next, we have the personnel consent agenda. Would everyone be okay if we took these all as one motion? Okay. May I have a motion for 10.1 through 10.6 of the personnel consent agenda? So moved. Second. And Mr. Dorn is going to join us. Welcome. Thank you. And good evening, President Davidson, Vice President Altman, members of the board, Dr. Kellogg and Ms. Marshall. I would like to present to you for your consideration tonight's personnel consent agenda. The items in tonight's very brief agenda mostly represent our regular staff action items with regards to resignations, hiring, and contractual status changes. There are a few items, however, that need to be noted in tonight's agenda. Tonight, we'd like to recognize Tyson Hilkert, who was selected as the first ever principal of Minerva France Elementary School. Tyson has done an outstanding job as the principal of Huber Ridge Elementary, and although he will be missed there, we are excited to have him open the building. Mr. Hilkert will start as the principal officially in July, but will participate in the hiring of staff, which has had over 150 applicants since the posting went up Friday. You will also see one-time pays, which include our wonderful nurses who uh, Spent the entire weekend here trying to catch up on COVID-related items. We're very thankful for their, their time. And we also have a memorandum of agreement with WESA uh, to allow WESA members to start serving as food service substitutes and still be able to make up the time that they're going to need to make up when they step out of their job for a couple hours a day. I'm happy to answer any questions for you. Hearing none, thank you so much. Ms. Marshall? Mrs. Altman? Yes. Dr. Mr. Baker? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. We do not have any old business tonight. That takes us to new business. 12.1 uh, and 12.2, I guess we can take these together. Policy 3419 and policy 4491, uh, group health plans. Ms. Marshall? So uh, this is a first reading, so there won't be a vote on it tonight. Right. Um, so I, I have the same change to both of these policies. One is for our certified staff, and the other one is the other policy is for our classified staff. So what we're doing with this is we're removing the um, 
the only option being to participate in our medical plan B. And so when we remove that from the policy, those who qualify our employees, so let me back up a little bit, I'm sorry. So this is for our employees who qualify for our medical plan through the Affordable Care Act. So they won't qualify under their current contract with the district through bargaining contracts or through board policy. But if they work an average of 30 hours or more a week during the measurement period that we use, then that will give them an offer of coverage in the following year. And so what we're doing, um, what we've been doing currently and what we updated in policy was an error for them to only be in plan B. We should have had the option of either plan A or plan B. So we'll remove that sentence that says that they're only eligible to participate in plan B so that they'll be able to participate in, e in either plan that we have. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Recommended action 13.1 um, to appoint a board designee, the CFO treasurer, Ms. Marshall, as public records official. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions? I mean, I'm okay if you all want to pick <laughs> Such a nice It job. will not hurt my feelings. You ready? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Bell? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. 13.2, a resolution to establish the 2022 Board of Education meeting calendar. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments here? I just should probably highlight a couple of things just sure. to make sure. Um, Want to note that um, we added a session on March 21st. Okay. Um, that was uh, uh, the additional um, meeting, but more important, the agenda will be the work session, the second work session we want to do. Um, that one's on there. And I want you to note that the annual city council board dinner has been moved from January to April, I think in hopes of being able to do something more in person. So um, those are the big change, uh, changes from what we had traditionally done. Everything else is pretty much um, boilerplate. Okay, thank you so much. Ms. Marshall? Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. 13.3, a resolution to appoint legal counsel for the Board of Education. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments here? I'll just mention that we annually appoint our legal counsel for the district. Um, so we have Bricker and Eckler that we work with as our general counsel for general matters throughout the district. And then we also have Rich and Gillis that we work with for um, property tax valuation disputes and any like TIF agreements or things like that. Thank you for that explanation. I take it for granted that each year that we do it, that people know what we're doing. So thank you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Dr. Nestbaker? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. 13.4, a resolution by the school district board to accept the amended master's facility plan for the Ohio Facilities Construction Committee as expedited local partnership program May I have a motion? So moved. Second. And Mr. Dorn is back with us. Again, thank you. The next two agenda items pertain to our overall facility master plan and the current five-year portion of the 10-year master plan. Previously, the district and the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission entered into a master facility plan agreement after the OFCC assessed all of our school facilities in 2017 and had an enrollment study conducted on our behalf. Once we accepted the initial master facility plan, we also entered into an agreement to begin work and earn credit towards future projects. This agreement was part of the Expedited Local Partnership Program, or ELP. In the ELP program, a district can earn credit towards future projects. When a district becomes eligible to participate in the Classroom Facilities Assistance Program, or CFAP, then it will qualify for state funding for projects in addition to the credit earned while in the ELP 
program. The projects included in this ELP plan include the buildings that are part of our first five-year portion of the 10-year plan, excluding Longfellow. The overall master facility plan has been adjusted to represent accurate planned student counts for the buildings that are part of the expedited local partnership program. For example, in the original facility master plan, Anhurst was shown to have 500 students as its capacity target and therefore required a specific sized addition to hold those students. Knowing that Anhurst Elementary's capacity was only going to be 450 students and designated as such, and that we were not going to add an addition that would suffice the OFCC to hold a 500 student count, um, Anhurst, Anhurst student count was reduced to meet the project goals and the overall, the overage of those students were then moved into another building that's not part of our current five-year plan. The OFCC did not alter our enrollment projections. They did not think the last two years were indicative of the future and therefore did not want to change the facility master plan to match. When we are finally eligible for the CFAP program, the district and the OFCC will go through this process again and the student count for all buildings will be adjusted accordingly. Financially, the overall facility master plan is reduced from 287.7 million to 260 million. The major causes for the reduction are partial, not full renovations on our current projects of this five-year plan, removal of swing space costs for some of our projects, the removal of storm shelter costs for all of our projects, and the removal of lead funds for all of our current projects with the exception of the two new buildings. The district, uh, this, excuse me, the discrete portion worksheet serves as a financial call out for all of the current work in our ELP project. As stated earlier, the overall plan has been adjusted to represent a more accurate scope of work for the buildings that are part of this five-year plan, including our new builds, Minerva France Elementary School and Minerva Park Middle School, as well as our renovation projects at Anhurst, Hawthorne, Whittier, Emerson, and Hamby. The discrete portion worksheet and the first amended and restated project agreement summarizes our anticipated project costs and how much of those costs will be creditable for future projects and how much will be locally funded initiatives or LFIs. Significant factors in the changes to the finances are for our current project costs. Uh, we were able to add the later phases of Westerville South High School into this project. So remember Westerville South started before we went into the agreement with the OFCC They've allowed us to add the later phases into this project. And instead of estimates, we actually have bids for some of our projects. So those real numbers were used instead of the estimates that were used to start the project. The OCC modified some of our projects from full renovations to partial renovations. Uh, for example, if the OCC's recommendation was to replace an entire electrical system in a building, and we knew that components of that still had useful life, we didn't pull those components out to replace them. We kept those components in, so that becomes a partial renovation as opposed to a full renovation. I know when we think of full renovation, we think, well, we've touched everything in the building, but that's not exactly what they mean when they say full renovation. Costs were removed for swing space, storm shelters, and for our existing buildings, lead allowances were removed. We are not going for a lead certifi certification for any of our existing buildings uh, that would have cost the the community significantly amount more, more money to get that certification. So given that the individual projects have changed and the corresponding LFIs percentages have also changed and all the original worksheet represented just over 89 million as potentially credible expenses, with these changes, creditable expenses are reduced to approximately $78 million. Again, these are estimates when the projects are completed and the true costs are defined so will be the creditable amounts and the LFI amounts. Happy to answer any questions about the 500-page document. <laughs> <shared with you. laughs> Fun to oh read. Gosh. Any questions? Um, yeah, actually, I know we've been through this a thousand times, but it always bears, I think, repeating creditable amounts. Can you just like remind everybody what, what that means for the future? So let's use the new middle school, Minerva Park Middle School, as an example. The Ohio Facilities Construction Commission 
um, takes the, pro the entire project as our, our plan uh, in consideration and determines what part they would, if we were eligible for the CFAP program, what part they would contribute money for. So they would not contribute money for athletic facilities and things like that. So that gets pulled out. That's part of our locally funded initiative or LFI. Then of the rest, that's the creditable expense. So if we go over in square footage, they'll deduct that overage in square footage based on what they think the building should be and call that our funded initiative and deduct it from the creditable expenses. So of that 78 million that we have in creditable expenses, uh, a lot of that is based on what we think the cost, of, the actual bids are gonna come in at anyways. And so if in that $78 million, the bids actually come in at $75 million, well then those three million, just they just go away and we can get credit if we meet. Um, so we have to meet the Ohio School Design Manual in order to get that credit or apply for waivers and things like that. So which are lead waivers and things like that you've seen throughout this process. So if, um, when they do the final calculations for creditable, so can I just use round numbers? Is that okay? Yeah. None of these numbers have anything to do with our project, okay? <laughs> None. So if we had $100 million in project and we qualify at this point in time, or our value, our, our state funding share is 35%, and we did a $100 million project and $100 million was creditable, we would earn $35 million in credit with the state. We don't actually get any money, right? Then when we go into another phase of our projects and we have the local funding to meet that phase then, and we qualify for the CFAP program, the classroom, the bigger program where they'll actually give us some money, Let's say we had another $100 million in project. They would actually give us the $35 million for that particular portion of the project and then the $35 million in credit. So that would be $70 million towards the $100 million project. So just using easy percentage numbers, none of those have anything to do with our project except the 35%. That is our number. And we are several years away from being eligible for the CFAP, but should time out nicely for the second five-year plan of our 10-year master plan. Hopefully. Great. Yeah. Thank you for running through that again and for pointing out that this is about building credits for future projects um, that we hope to get to in that phase. Great. Thank you very much. Ms. Marshall? Dr. Nestbreaker? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. 13.5, Ohio Facilities Construction Commission first amended and reinstated project agreement. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions here? I feel like Scott addressed a lot of this. Okay. Ms. Marshall? Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Dr. Nestor Baker? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. 14.1, public comments. We do not have any this evening. 5.1 is board comments. Would anyone like to go? Would anyone like to go first? Okay. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to um, say I'm really excited to be up here um, and thank everyone for um, the staff and for onboarding me. Um, what I really saw during this process is uh, um, a lot of progress being made during a really challenging time in the pandemic. And I think that speaks volumes to the skill <coughs> and the passion and the commitment of the teachers and the staff. And so I know how tired you all must be. And as a board member and as a mom, I just wanna say thank you. Um, that's really about it. And thanks, Peg, I will look into the online uh, training. Um, well, I just want to say welcome and welcome back. Um, <laughs> glad to glad to be up here with you all. And um, just to piggyback on that a, a little bit, we all know how 
really difficult things are right now. I mean, I don't think there's actually been a harder time because we're all trying to sort of get back to normal and things are really, really not normal. Um, so just again, thanks to everybody all the way through who is making things work the best they can. That's from families who are juggling things constantly um, with the call that they might get it. I hear 555 from some people or 615 from others <laughs> um, and, and juggling last minute. And I think none of us want those calls to be last minute, but we, you know, we, this, this district does not know until the last minute because we're always trying to have a normal day for kids. And so that's always the hope that we're holding out. Um, and it's sometimes not until very early that morning that we know that can't happen. So just um, appreciating everybody's patience and again, staff, administrators, just everyone for pitching in. Um, thank you. Um, let me first, uh, I'd like to say welcome back um, to everyone as we start a, uh, a new year uh, filled with the um, all of the hope and optimism and opportunity that a new year presents. Um, congratulations, Ms. Davidson, Ms. Altman, um, as our new board leadership, and certainly welcome uh, on board, Mrs. Meyer. Um, I would like to um, just give a brief report um, to you all um, on, uh, regarding our participation um, as a board and as a district in the Vouchers Hurt Ohio um, uh, uh, partnership of school districts across the state of Ohio. Uh, on January the 4th, uh, last week, um, Vouchers Hurt Ohio um, a, a, um, collect, a, a collective of over 100 school districts from across the state of Ohio officially filed a lawsuit um, against the state of Ohio for um, its um, um, voucher program. Um, this is, uh, uh, we're going to court to secure and protect our system of common schools. Um, and common schools are our public school system. Tax dollars should not be um, spent on separate private systems of schools um, that are um, really reserved for the privileged few. The Ohio Constitution is clear. The Ohio General Assembly shall secure a system of public education for all children, uh, not multiple systems, uh, not one for the haves and one for the have-nots. And we believe that the Ed Choice Private School Voucher Program is unconstitutional. Um, it's not the responsibility of Ohio taxpayers to pay for the private school education provided um, because of the choice of some parents um, who never intended or never planned on putting their children in public schools. These are not failing schools. These are situations where families are seeking refunds and rebates to pay for private school education. Lawmakers and the governor um, are not funding public schools fully based on a decision handed down by the Ohio Supreme Court, the Duroff case. They are siphoning off $250 million a year and diverting those funds to private schools when they aren't fully funding classrooms and teachers for our public school students. Um, this is not only unconstitutional, but we believe it's wrong. The Ohio legislature is, in a sense, creating two separate systems of education in the state of Ohio, two systems, separate and unequal. Private school vouchers, um, uh, um, private schools um, are able to, uh, that are private schools that are receiving tax dollars are unaccountable for the money that they receive and how it is spent. They are also able to discriminate based on race, wealth, athletic skill, physical ability, and academic scores. Public schools are not. Our public schools doors are open to all children. The Ohio Supreme Court ordered lawmakers and the governor 
to rely less, not more, on local property taxes. And the current voucher system demands that local boards of education and local public school districts reply, um, rely more heavily on property taxes. The state is guaranteeing that private high schools will get $7,500, $7,500 per pupil. Public high school students are getting nearly a third less, on average, $5,149 per pupil. Vouchers, simply put, hurt Ohio, hurt students, families, taxpayers, homeowners, educators, local businesses, and communities. Um, so I'll keep you um, informed and up to date uh, as the legislation now makes its way through the court system, but just wanted to uh, make sure to um, let you all know that that, that, that um, suit has been filed. Um, one additional thing that I would like to mention, um, I would like to thank um, the board and the districts for its um, continued um, partnership and support of the um, uh, Leadership Westerville Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Project's Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast Celebration. Uh, the 17th Annual MLK uh, Breakfast Celebration will be held next, um, next Monday on the 17th. Uh, now, because of the current COVID situation, um, uh, we have had to transition it to an all virtual event this year um, in order to protect the, the safety and well-being of all of the participants and, and the community at large. Um, the theme for this year's breakfast is justice for all. And um, the program will feature um, a panel discussion that will be moderated by Angela Ann, a 10 TV news anchor. And the panel will consist of Ms. Christy Angel, the YWCA Columbus president and CEO, the Honorable Jiza Page, a uh, judge in the uh, Franklin County, and Alex Shanks, who is the director of community prevention initiatives for Equitas Health. Um, and more information uh, can be found. You can find you can find the event on Eventbrite under the 2022 Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Westerville Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast. <coughs> that's it for me. <laughs> I know that's a lot. <laughs> Well, I don't have as much to say as that, <laughs> uh, but I want to um, start off by welcoming you, Christy, to huh, welcome. Welcome to <laughs> this time and welcome to all that, that uh, we are dealing with as a school system and a community and as a society. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you want to be here. It's, it's exciting and frustrating and fulfilling all at the same time. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, I want to say thank you to you, Vaughn for your leadership last year. Um, it was a joy to serve with you uh, as you were in that position. I thank you for being a steady hand on the wheel during a time that steadiness doesn't often happen. So thank you for uh, your willingness to serve in that role uh, for that year. Um, you know, John talked about how we have uh, kept our eye on the future and you're right, we have. I'm, I'm really glad that we have, uh, we being the district as a whole, not, not just the board. And at the same time, <coughs> we are keeping all of us, our eye on the now and working through what is arguably the most difficult time in the history of this school district. Um, it's hard, it's exhausting work to be in education right now at any level, in any position. The days are long, the problems are tough, and they are not what many people thought they would take on when they decided to become teachers uh, or bus drivers or administrators or anyone else within the system. 
even so, there is so much good going on. And I don't want us ever to lose sight of that. that I know it sounds kind of like an oxymoron, but there are everyday miracles that are happening in all of our buildings, in this building as well, as we work through this remarkable time. And I want to acknowledge that those everyday miracles are happening. And I also want to say that I hope, you know, I, I believe that we as a board will stand with the people uh, who work within our school system, who live within our community. We will stand together to come through what remains of this difficult time. And when we come through it, we will be prepared because we have not, as a school district, taken our eye off of the future. And part of that involves the 500-page document that Scott Dorn sent to us for our holiday reading pleasure. <laughs> and part of it involves our willingness to stand with the 99 other school districts in saying this is wrong when it comes to the stripping of the public school system in Ohio. And part of it has to do with all of the great things that you talk about, uh, John, in your comments, the things that are going on in our classroom, the things that are going on in our operations. And all of it has to do with the human capital of this school district. And we have incredible resources in human capital here. The people that we have working day after day after day are among the finest anywhere. And you talked about, we say thank you a lot. I don't think we can ever say thank you enough or can ever say enough that our eye is on the now and that we care deeply about what happens in our buildings, in our offices, in our homes in this particular school district and across our country. So it's a new year for the board. It's midway through the year for the students and the staff. It is time to reconnect and recharge and keep that eye on the future at the same time as we hold on to doing what we have to do for the now. It's going to be okay. Um, just really quick, Christy, I am so grateful you're here. I look forward to serving with you and each of you. Um, if you have any questions, I'm sure I would be happy to answer or any of us. I know it's a little overwhelming and it's going to take about four years for you to figure out, just so you know, because there's a lot. Um, yeah, but it's a lot of fun. Um, and it's fun to um, stand up for our children, our staff, and our community. And I think that we all do that really well. So welcome. Um, congratulations again, Jen. I look forward to leadership and serving with you there. Um, to Vaughn. Thanks for the update. That was really helpful. And thank you for going down there and representing Westerville City Schools. That's really important that we were part of that. And I really appreciate it. So um, that's it for me tonight. I'm going to keep it short. Thank you to everyone. And uh, as the new year starts, you know, thank you to our staff and our students and our kiddos. Hang with us. We're going to do this. Um, up next, 16.1 approval. Since we approved 13.2, we will meet in regular session on Monday, January 24th, 2022 in the Early Learning Center. Um, as a reminder, space will be limited to 50 people and comply with the health and safety protocols based on CDC guidance. Mask will be required and social distancing observed. 17.1, uh, may I have a motion for executive session for the purpose of considering the compensation and employment of a public employee. So moved. Second. Second. Ms. Marshall? Dr. Nesterbaker? Yes. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Ottman? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go into executive session and then we'll come back here and end the meeting.
Okay, we just returned from executive session, and now we are at 18.1, adjournment. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. And Ms. Marsha, whenever you're ready to call the roll. Mr. Bell? Yes. Mrs. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Altman? Yes. Dr. Nestbreaker? Yes. Mrs. Davidson? Yes. And we're adjourned. Oh.